Today we're going to be talking about Messenger. My name is Alex Morimoto. I'm the developer advocate for the Messenger platform. And today I'm talking to Anthony Kesich, who is a fantastic developer on the M team. So uh, Anthony, thanks for joining us. Uh, Certainly. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about what you do at Facebook? Certainly. Uh, so my day-to-day -day job is mostly working as a back-end engineer on M suggestions. So M suggestions is this feature within Messenger um, that works as your personal assistant uh, within your conversation. So for example, if you said something like thanks to your friend, it might uh, put up a set of stickers for you to reply back mm -hmm. and uh, express your gratitude. Or if your friend asks where you are, it might give you a button to allow you to share your location so you two can meet up. Uh, the idea behind this is we want to give you the ability to do what you need uh, right in conversation. So um, day to day, I work on building the back end for that that allows all this classification to work and allows these suggestions to um, surface uh, within your uh, conversation. So uh, before that, though, I worked on the wit.ai platform, um, partly just maintaining the platform and also working on the SDK that allowed for voice activity detection, allowed for people to speak to our platform and do uh, intent detection. Sure. Wit is, is actually a free platform for all developers to use in order to integrate natural language processing into mm -hmm. their apps or their software, right? Certainly. Yeah, Wit is a uh, API that you can call basically wherever you have an internet connection. And given either a uh, voice stream or just a set of text, um, we can classify uh, predetermined intents that you have trained on the platform and give you back uh, uh, basically what the user is trying to express with their intent uh, given a set of example phrases um, from your corpora. Nice. So I, I'd like to get to a question actually from a developer in Kathmandu because mm -hmm. actually before WIT, right, that's kind of not the whole story. You you actually have a background in nuclear physics. You have a PhD in nuclear physics from UC Davis, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah, I was at uh, Davis for five years there working on uh, nuclear physics. I it's actually worked. Uh, yeah, it was a fun time. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was working on high-energy nuclear physics, so that's stuff with colliders. And that really is a lot of big data. We just slam particles together at hundreds of thousands of times per second and record what's interesting. So basically, we have this big data set that we need to dig through. And uh, um, so while it was different in that it was physics instead of computer science, um, ultimately, it was uh, doing an analysis of a large data set and trying to sure. dig something out. So when looking at WIT and looking at voice processing and natural language processing, I just saw it as something very similar yeah. where you're just digging through a signal and trying to extract some So how, how did you actually get from doing something like a PhD in, PhD in nuclear physics to where you are today as a software engineer? Certainly. Um, so basically, I've played with software most of my life. I had a uh, uh, <laughs> good friend's father gave me a book when I was about 10 that was JavaScript for dummies. Nice. And uh, I, I played with that and started making some simple web apps. And then throughout uh, high school, throughout college, I always found ways to incorporate coding into my daily life. Like I was part of a uh, robotics team for many years throughout high school. And then in college, I, uh, I would just um, do side projects that found a way to um, you know, add a little coding here and there. And then, as I mentioned in grad school, it's, it was a ton of data analysis. Everything we did was C++, so it was coding all the time. You can't look through a billion events by hand. Right. <laughs> Man, crazy background. So, so you worked on WIT, and then the WIT team ended up joining Facebook, right? So mm -hmm. how, did, how do you get from there to M? Like, how, how did M get started uh, from, you know, the WIT team? Certainly. Um, so M actually kind of had two steps uh, to its current evolution. Uh, one thing that the WIT team played with before we joined Facebook was this concept of a uh, human-assisted interface. So it was a chat bot that you would teach what to say, and it used a lot of natural language processing and algorithms to come up with what needed to be said. But when it couldn't, it would fall back on humans. So we had started building this, this interface. And then when we came to Facebook, we had the resources to actually test this on employees and then to a small set of users. So we built out this interface even further and um, saw that people really liked it. Like, but it wasn't exactly something that we could immediately release to the rest of the world because sure. this, this AI still needed training and coaching and supervision, even though it did some pretty amazing things. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we looked at this version of M that was powered by humans and said, OK, what do people like about it? They like uh, um, reminders for when their meetings are. They like. Uh, assistance looking up information. And so we took those basic things and said, how can we 
how can we take this from something that needs to be run by people and funnel it down into something that can run on machine learning? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we did that and also came up with a handful of other features that Messenger has that people might like to use. Yes. And um, that way we can bring it to all of the US and eventually most of the rest of the world. Awesome. So that, that actually takes me to a really good question that we got from a developer in Casablanca. And uh, they were wondering if you could just explain a little bit about how M actually works, right? Because to the user, it seems a little bit like, like some magic going on, right? It's just this automated mm -hmm. personal assistant. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the architecture of that looks like or how you actually, go, how, how you actually make the recommendations that you do in M? Uh, certainly, but uh, there's a little bit going on there, so why don't I draw it out for you, because a picture is worth a thousand words. Awesome. I'm a big fan of flowcharts. All right, so let's see what we can do here. So in Messenger, you, you've sent something, some message to your friend, and it goes through whoop, right to them. But then we also take a copy of that and send it right to a classifier. So this classifier is something that looks for different intents. Are you asking a location? Are you saying thanks? Are you, uh, are you looking for a ride? And so it answers each of these questions and figures out you know, which one it is. And then that is sent through some processing and we come up with some suggestions. Now in this case, we'd have a bunch of stickers. So like, you know, somebody saying, hi. And you know, a, you know, a heart or, or something like that. And those would then be sent off to the user's device. So you got your phone here. And you get a bunch of suggestions at the bottom. Now, you then come in and you uh, click on one of them because you like it and whoop, that's sent to your friend. But then also, a signal is sent back to our server and we log for you uh, whether you clicked it or not. And over time, we log, did you click it? Did you dismiss it? Did you ignore it? and send that back to our classifier, and we start learning what you like doing, what you don't like doing, and this is then reprocessed over and over until uh, we learn what you like doing, and this makes the whole loop better and better. You know, obviously there's a lot more going on kind of under the covers with this, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you actually trained that classifier to begin with. Certainly. Um, so really, to bootstrap this classifier, it was built based on um, suggestions from employees. So we had people just come up with different ways of asking for a ride or expressing that they were going to take a ride to their friend's place or saying thanks or looking for where somebody it's was. It's amazing how, how many ways there are to say common things, huh? There really are. And that's where the beauty of machine learning comes in. Because even given like a small set of examples, given a, a diverse enough set, you'll pick up other ways of saying things that wasn't in your original set. And so you can suggest things even based on uh, phrases that we didn't come up with. Sure. And then from there, it was built based on feedback from users. Awesome. So, so Based on the work that you've done, not just on M, but also on WIT, can you talk a little bit about what you think are some of the main challenges in artificial intelligence or machine learning right now? Sure. Well, um, I can talk about something that really applies to where I'm using it, which is just applying machine learning instead of engineering the, the algorithms behind that. And that is choosing the difference between deep learning and feature engineering. So just as a general overview, deep learning is where you have a multi-layer neural net where you just throw data at it. You let it figure out how to process the inputs and come up with what's interesting and come up with an output. Whereas feature engineering is where, um, for example, in our case, uh, we feed it features like how often did somebody click on the suggestion? How many suggestions were they shown? Um, how active of a user are they? What time of the day it is? Things that we think might influence uh, whether they would want to click on something. So on one hand, uh, uh, Deep learning is easier because you can just throw data at it and figures it out, but you need a ton, a mm -hmm. ton, a ton of data to do deep learning. Whereas with feature engineering, you can really bootstrap from much smaller data set if you can come up with clever features to mm -hmm. feed into your net. Nice. So I mean, obviously a, a very dense topic. Do you have any uh, suggestions for like learning resources or books for any developers that are interested in getting into machine learning? 
Certainly. Well, I want to take a little step back from that instead of just looking at uh, resources. One thing I suggest for getting into machine learning is actually building something yourself. So you don't need to build a, model a modern neural net. You don't need to build some state-of-the-art LSTM. Uh, the first neural net I ever built was a single layer, and it was something that literally just predicted, was my next input going to be yes or no? <laughs> and I'd say yes, and it would guess, oh, I guessed you thought no, okay, I was wrong. And then I'd say yes or no, or yes or no, and it tried to predict it, and oh my god, after like four or five things, it, it knew me. I thought I was random, but I wasn't. Um, and this was built with a couple of feature, basic features, like were my last couple of inputs the same? Were they different? Was it a yes? Was it a no? And it retrained itself, re relearned the weights on how to predict what was coming out. And just from that, that simple, simple neural net, I got a feeling for how things worked. Now, going on from there, I didn't build all my own neural nets. I would use things off the shelf, but I wanted to understand how they worked. So um, something that I read recently that was a, a good, like, it was deep, but had a good overview of what was going on was a, a book called um, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Christopher Bishop. And it's, it's about 10 years old, but it really covers a lot of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And reading through that book, I felt like I had a really good understanding of general machine learning. So M just launched in some other countries, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that and about how that happened? Sure. Um, so this is actually one of the most fun things I feel like I've done in my job. Uh, we recently launched M in both Mexico and Spain. And mm -hmm. if you know anything about those two countries, they aren't majority English speakers. It's Spanish. Um, and mi español no es bueno. Uh, but because of the magic of machine learning and machine translation, we were actually able to take this, this data set that we accumulated in English beyond, from the, the original bootstrapping we did and the feedback from users and take that and actually translate it in, into Spanish and with a minimal oversight from some human uh, labelers, mm -hmm. uh, we could make sure that we had a good data set and train a new classifier that works in Spanish for a handful of our intents. And this is, this is phenomenal because it feels like magic to me. I, I can't speak Spanish, but somehow I'm serving millions and millions of people every day in context with what they want to get done in their conversation. So, man, machine translation is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to tell developers? Sure. Um, well, first off, we always appreciate any feedback you, that you have. Uh, your feedback helps us make Messenger a better product. You can always reach out in your developer circle and ideas that are posted in there get filtered back up to the team and we can act on them. Uh, beyond that, there's also the Messenger Platform Developer Community, which is a great place where if you have suggestions for new features in the API to allow you as a developer to use Messenger better, please reach out there and uh, we can help implement them. Uh, beyond that, on an M-specific level, uh, if you want to help make M better, uh, one of the easy ways to do that is give feedback. If you like a suggestion, click on it. If a suggestion is irrelevant uh, and you just don't want to use it right now, you can swipe the entire bar away. But if a suggestion is really bad and you don't think it should ever come up here, you can long press on that suggestion and click that it isn't right. And we will learn from that in that feedback loop that I mentioned before. And it'll help other people who use Messenger uh, have a better experience and give them a better version of M. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Anthony, for taking the time today and answering some of the questions from the community. And, uh, thank all, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for our AMA today with uh, Anthony Kesich. That was my pleasure. Nice to meet you.